So one of the um, things we can keep in mind, <clears throat> you can hear me okay? Everyone else is muted, it's perfect. Um, <laughs> uh, I should mute myself and see what happens. Um, one of the, uh, one of the things we should remember, um, which I think this type of uh, circumstance can help us remember, is um, that <clears throat> we always have a kind of um, a duality that we live in. You know? The, the ultimate is the form and emptiness or the nirvana and samsara, but you know, that's, that's too abstract. <clears throat> I mean, just the, the duality that we're always alone and we're always together. And that's something that um, when we're sitting and we're sitting alone or with a couple people, but then we're in a group of, you know, I look and I see, wow, there are 55 people if that's true, and, um, and we're alone and together. And it's, you know, just our senses that deceive us, you know, and our ideas. So you know, what we perceive is not necessarily um, the full reality. This is, this is what I'm trying to to say is that, you know, we're sitting alone right now, and yet at the very same time, we're all together. In a real way, even if this technology was not enabling it, we should walk away from this reminder that the technology gives us. And this technology is just a reminder to say, um, when you're alone, you're together. You know, in, in a real way, not in an imaginary way. And we think, okay, we're together because we're all doing the same activity. Yeah, okay. But you're also together when you're not doing the same activity. And so when we are um, sitting on our own and we don't connect to you know, a group doing the same thing, or when you have a moment of, of quiet and intention in your day and a moment of reflection or a moment of sitting and perhaps feeling lonely or isolated. This is when we can recall the uh, Sangha of humanity that is, you know, our, our true community and that you know, we're alone and together. And that's just part of the duality that we always live. And it often depends on what we choose in this moment to include in our intention or to focus on, you know? <clears throat> Which is really all the time a question of what we do, um, not with our specific situation, but what we do with our awareness of it, you know? and the intention we bring into it. One of the, um, one of the great teachings by Dogen is in his um, advice to the cook, which I've read sometimes. And um, he uses the um, instruction of all the different ingredients that the head cook uses. And that sometimes all they have in the kitchen are some some weeds 
and sometimes they have you know rich rich cream and luxurious and expensive ingredients and he said the practice is you know to make a, a fine soup or you know a, a great delicacy out of those weeds and when you have the luxurious one the great cream not to think like okay you know i've got everything i need i'm all set because when you think you're all set that's when you probably lose the cream so our um our instruction from dogen is to take the ingredients and oh, make it into the oh, great meal of our practice and that's you know and every day we go and we find a different we have a different set of ingredients how do we uh, not despair when you know the cupboard only has a few weeds or when it's a full of you know fine ingredients not to take that for granted so this is sort of the middle way again that we we're talking about last week you know between these extremes so how do we use our body our speech and our mind in a way that can um, really practice well with what we have and it's a, a big challenge the funny thing is when we're on retreat like we know that our lives are going to be limited so you know we're in seclusion but we feel like we chose it so we're going to make the best of it <clears throat> but the real practice is to use the ingredients you didn't choose mm. which in life is probably most of them <laughs> <clears throat> so um so i wanted to share with you this is as i said it's a question of what we do with our body speech and mind in any given circumstance you know i don't want to elevate one and say oh this is so great for the dharma for the practice you know like the harder the better remember the buddha specifically in his first teaching that we spoke of last week, he very clearly, the first teaching he gave was to say, avoid extremes. You know, the first teaching was, was not getting away from pleasure. It was getting away from asceticism and self-denial. That was the first instruction he gave, which is kind of like saying, you know, you shouldn't think that hardship is really great for your practice. Like that, that's not the message of the Dharma that, you know, suffering is, is your best friend, you know. But it's also not saying that, you know, we should run after pleasure and, and the reason we can't really practice is because we don't have enough good things. So that was sort of what we were talking about last week. <clears throat> but what I wanted to um, talk a little bit with you this week and then hear more from you before we we sit a little bit more is um what type of awareness uh, we can bring into uh, circumstances that we don't choose so that we can make our lives more our practice <clears throat> instead of always just like waiting for things to change so that we can you know Feel more comfortable or practice better. <clears throat> so um, that's what I wanted to to think about with you, um, and why it is that, and how it is that two people can experience the same experience, or even grow up in the same environment, and have a really different understanding. And appreciation of it you know how that can be um, and how it can also be because of the law of change that um, you can be in a really good situation but your mind can you know find fault and start to um, become upset 
and miss that beauty. Or you can find yourself in a challenging situation and really be open and expanded. You know, we've all been in situations, let's look at the beautiful one first, where um, you, know, you could be in a beautiful location, a beautiful hike, but you're upset because you're thinking about something that bothered you or something you know, difficult that happened. So it's not really dependent on the outer circumstances. <clears throat> and similarly, you know, we can find ourselves in, in a difficult outer circumstances and our minds can be more open and subtle and supple and caring. So, so we see and we kind of understand pretty, pretty clearly that um, we're the ones that have to work on our minds. You know, so how do we do that? <clears throat> I wanted to, um, to read a couple of different uh, approaches one from the Dhammapada, the Theravada, and one from Shantideva, you know, which is talking about awareness. <clears throat> so the first one is this, just want to look at uh, from, you guys have this in, um, this is in, uh, you guys have this, I think, in Gilad House. In fact, I think Dan, is, I don't think he's here, maybe he's here, but I think Dan gave this to me. It's like a new translation. I don't know what new, maybe sort of new. Hello. Don't want to interrupt. We're listening. You remember this, Dan? Yeah, I'm not sure about it, but yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, you gave it to me. I don't I don't remember, I think, where you were. Oh, because you went to I think you went to Amarvati. No. Where'd you go? Something like that. Cheater something. Yeah, one of those places. Um, so I'm going to read the verse on awareness, which is also called mindfulness. Um, you know, so what kind of, this is like the, the question I'm asking is, what kind of awareness do we want to bring to our situation so that we can, you know, live uh, our practice more fully? Um, it's not what I want to take from the situation. You know, that's, that's the reverse direction. The question we should be asking is, what do I want to give to my situation? You know, that's, that's really what I think. And that's why this awareness is not so much the awareness on what, you know, how does this situation or environment support my awareness? What kind of awareness does it create? No, what kind of awareness do I bring to it? You know, as I said before, you can be in a beautiful environment or monastery retreat, and it's not going to do it for you. You know. So <clears throat> this is the, the chapter. Appreciative awareness leads to life. <clears throat> And heedless avoidance is the path to death. Those who are aware are fully alive, while those who are heedless are as if already dead. The wise being fully alive rejoice in appreciative awareness and abide delighting in this capacity. The awakened ones firm in their resolve vigorously apply themselves and no freedom from bondage, liberation, and true security. Okay, so those are the first, uh, the first few ones, few verses. And it goes on saying, those who are energetically committed to the way, who are pure and considerate in effort, composed and virtuous in conduct, steadily increase in radiance. Okay, I want to continue one more, and then I'll go over them. By endeavor, vigilance, restraint, and self-control. Let the wise one make islands of themselves, which no flood can overwhelm. 
So that's that's a classic um, and a well-known verse, which the Buddha said uh, upon his death as well to Ananda when he was dying. He said, "You should make an island of yourself." Also, they said a, a light of yourself or a raft, depending on on how it's translated. But here it's you know the wise ones make islands of themselves, and um, and so. I want to um, go over this for a moment with you <clears throat> so we can understand appreciative awareness, appreciative awareness, you know, which is really a, a beautiful term, appreciative awareness, you know? that type of awareness, which is appreciative. You know? I see this situation. I'm aware of this as, as my practice. This is actually what I need right now. You know, it may not be what I want, but this is what I need. What do I mean I need? Need to fix my sins, whatever. No, this is what I need to be aware of because this is my life right now. And if I'm not aware of it and I don't appreciate that this is life, this is it, then as he said, that's, you know, it's the path to death. Not death, but death of, I mean, not the physical death, but death of the alive awareness of being alive. Being alive is not picking and choosing what life is. It's life as it is. So this appreciative awareness is saying, okay, I appreciate, and again, appreciation doesn't mean I like it, right? It means I fully accept that this is what I need to be aware of right now. This is it. This is it. Okay. And <clears throat> it's not something, um, it's not something that is easily come by. Right? Because as we see, he said, the awakened ones in 23, he says, firm in their resolve, vigorously apply themselves and no freedom from bondage. Right. So sometimes we um, have an idea that the meditative awareness is, you know, soft and generous and open and receptive and all very like shanty. And that may be, but there's another aspect to it when it's difficult. You see, that's when it's easy. When it's easy, you can relax, right? But when it's difficult, this is why we have the instruction here of vigor, you know, of putting energy to it. And as it says here, um, those who are energetically committed to the way, right? Pure and considerate in effort, composed and virtuous in conduct. You know, there's a lot here that we're including in this appreciative awareness. There's effort, okay, virtue and conduct, there's sila. Um, restraint and self-control, right? <clears throat> they steadily increase in their radiance. So these are really important qualities that we see that there's a strong connection between the type of um, practice awareness, contemplative awareness, you know, meditative awareness, and right effort, you know, the right effort here, right? to be able to really fully appreciate um, this moment as, you know, this is, this is my life. Like it's, this is it, this is, this is everything. And it's not about good or bad. It just is about, can I meet this without resistance? You know, cause what does resistance do? Um, Pema Chodron, she, she, um, in one section of her book called The Wisdom of No Escape, which I was looking at because I love the title, The Wisdom of No Escape. <laughs> and and she, in um, one section, she goes over the Four Noble Truths and um, she said the second noble truth, which is the origin of suffering, can be called resistance, it's resistance. It's when we 
resist and reject our experience. Now, we, we simply don't want it. And that not wanting, or wanting something else, or wanting it not to change, that wanting and not wanting, or that resistance, you know, shuts us down. And it's the opposite of what in the Dhammapada we have as um, appreciative awareness. So like, you know, the opposite energy is resistance. And you can notice that very clearly in your subtle awareness when you're focusing not just on the outer world, but on the inner world of your body, speech, and mind, you know, especially in your mental states, and you notice the afflictive emotions that come up and afflict you, meaning they give you stress, you know, and the stress generally comes from a sense of rejection, meaning you rejecting some perception, experience, thought, reality. Again, I'm not in no way saying that we should want it when it's difficult. You know, again, that's why I started last week with saying the Buddha's first teachings were avoiding those extremes of, you know, thinking that we should suffer and that, or we should just have pleasure. The middle way between you know, wanting to have pain and wanting to have pleasure is wanting to be aware of both states equally. That's the middle point. You know, it's not the middle point of saying, okay, in between pain and pleasure, there's sort of, you know, I don't know, neutral. No, it's appreciative awareness. When there's pain, there's pain. When there's pleasure, there's pleasure. The pain will pass, the pleasure will pass. <clears throat> what upsets people most about, or one of the things that upsets people about the, the perhaps isolation and, and illness and situation right now with our uh, pandemic is, um, not necessarily what you're specifically experiencing, but all the um, fearful thoughts that come to mind. <clears throat> and instead of thinking that we can end those thoughts, we, in appreciative awareness, in this sort of approach, we're not saying the thoughts are good or bad. We're not saying they shouldn't be but we're facing them clearly and we're appreciating them as as real as everything else that's in my life. <clears throat> and this is where we come back to the, um, the verse where you said, by endeavor, vigilance, restraint and self-control, let the wise one let the wise make islands of themselves, which no flood can overwhelm. <clears throat> Endeavor, vigilance, restraint, and self-control. Those are really, you know, qualities that when we think about our awareness, we can say, you know, often when we teach about mindfulness, we say like, be mindful of your um, experience, be mindful of like your breathing, be mindful of the sounds, be mindful of, your senses. But then how do we, you know, is mindfulness just something on its own? No, it has supporting qualities. The awareness that we're cultivating has supporting qualities. Okay. There's vigilance. What is vigilance? V vigilance is zeal. One of the oh pillars of Zen, we say, you know, there's great faith, there's great doubt, and there's great zeal or determination. Here it's just translated as vigilance. Vigilance is saying like, I'm gonna keep, you know, focused here. Like, I'm gonna remember what I'm doing. And I may have to remember to remember, right? Or even remember to remember to remember, you know, 
So you, your vigilance here of remembering that you're on a path of awakening may need support to remember, like a morning group or an evening group or a Dharma talk you listen to or you know a few verses that you read every day or a Dharma friend that you talk to. I don't know, the picture you put on your computer, you know? I mean, is it a picture of ice cream or is it a Buddha? Like, whatever you can use to help you remember to come back to your original intention is vigilance, right, is vigilance. <clears throat> so yeah, um, vigilance, restraint, self-control, okay? This is uh, the effort and this is sila. So we see that you know, a moral life of conduct and control, um, the vigilance of keeping the effort alive will awaken and support the type of understanding, awareness, and wisdom you want to have. <clears throat> Making an island of yourself <clears throat> kind of sounds like we are um, becoming even more isolated. It's an interesting metaphor. <laughs> we shouldn't take it the wrong way. You may feel you're, you're already an island. Let the wise ones make islands of themselves, which no flood can overwhelm. Mm. It's the flood of your afflictive emotions that you don't want to be over, overwhelmed with. You know, the waves of fear, of anger, of tension, of anxiety, okay, of the different hindrances, like the five hindrances, okay, ill will and skeptical doubt and restlessness and lack of motivation and boredom, okay, <clears throat> or anger. You know, these, these afflictive emotions, right? Those are the floods that can completely flood the kind of safe place that you want to create in your mind. It's not an escape, right? But the real island is, you know, that safe place in your mind where you know that you are in control of your mind, not the other way around. No. The outer world does not control your mind. That's a basic um, understanding in our oh, cultivation of awareness. Again, coming back to the basic question that we should be asking ourselves. What am I giving to this situation? Not, what am I receiving from it? So when you make that um, equation, then you've created a safe place. <clears throat> Again, is this easy? No, <laughs> sounds like, yeah, just you know, decide and you'll do it. And this is why we have vigilance and we have restraint and we have effort, okay? So it's hard, it's hard. Seek out as much support as you can in others and in yourself, in your environment and in the world. So it's a time to um, you know, take refuge in the Dharma more than you have in the past. So I'd like to now offer a slightly different perspective that can help us as well. <clears throat> and it's from uh, Shantideva. And it's from this book here. All right. Shantideva. When I look at this, it's backwards. So I don't know, maybe it's backwards for you, but 
Oh, it's right side up. Mute. Um, so this is a, this is a bo, uh, Gajah Bodhisattva's way of life. And um, it's a seminal text written in the eighth century by the uh, Indian monk Shanti Deva. Um, and he, he wrote different chapters on how to cultivate and maintain um, the right intention. And um, this is, you know, a, a beautiful text. It really is. Um, and it's a different style. So I wanted to share it because it's inspiring. And, um, and it's been inspiring for many years. This translation is by uh, Stephen Bachelor. So the English is pretty readable. And this one, this copy is from 1979. I know there's been newer copies made, but this is an old one that I actually picked up in the, um, the Library of Tibetan Archives in Dharamsala one time when I was there. So um, I've been carrying this for a while. Chapter three, um, the full acceptance of the awakening mind. And this is a famous uh, few verses that you may have heard as well. <clears throat> so when, just to compare with, with this, the Dhammapada and the Pali approach of, um, of cultivating appreciative awareness and all that involves, you know, which we just looked at, I wanna, you know, balance this with the, um, the intention of the awakening mind, which brings in a different quality and I want, I want you to, um, to hear it. So, gladly do I rejoice in the virtue that relieves the misery of all those in unfortunate states and that places those with suffering in happiness. I rejoice in the gathering of virtue that is the cause for awakening. And I rejoice in the definite freedom of all creatures from the misery of cyclic existence. I rejoice in the awakening of the Buddhas. And with gladness I rejoice in the ocean of virtue from developing an awakening mind that wishes all beings to be happy, as well as in the deeds that bring them benefit. <clears throat> But thus, by the virtue collected through all that I have done, may the pain of every living creature be completely cleared away. May I be the doctor and the medicine, and may I be the nurse for all sick beings in the world until everyone is healed. May a rain of food and drink descend to clear away the pain of thirst and hunger and during the eons of famine, may I myself change into food and drink. May I become an inexhaustible treasure for those who are poor and destitute. May I turn into all things they could need and may these be placed close beside them. Without any sense of loss, I will give up my things and my enjoyment, as well as all my virtues for the sake of benefiting all. By giving up all, sorrow is transcended, and my mind will realize this sorrowless state. <clears throat> so it goes on, and, and a bit later, <clears throat> he says, may I be a protector for those without one, a guide for all travelers on the way. May I be a bridge, a boat, and a ship for all who wish to cross the water. May I be an island for those who seek one and a lamp for those desiring light. May I be a bed for all those who wish to rest and a slave for all who want to slave. May I be a wishing jewel, a magic vase, powerful mantras and great medicine. May I become a wish fulfilling tree and a cow of plenty for the world. Just like space and the great elements such as earth, may I always support the life of all the boundless creatures. 
and until they pass away from pain, may I also be the source of life for all the realms of varied beings that reach into the ends of space. So we have this expanded vision of the Bodhisattva that Shantideva brings to us. The wishing tree, the greatness of the mind, of the intention. And here we can join the islands together so that, you know, you have an, a safe place for your mind. But in that safe place of your appreciative awareness, it becomes also a safe place for others. That's the amazing thing about creating the island of your mind that is not flooded by difficult feelings, judgments, anger and ill will, that it creates a bridge so that others can share your island. <clears throat> this is the great vision that we can have. And it's not a fantasy, but it's, it doesn't come just by you know, reading it. This takes, you know, there's the effort involved. The rest of the book is all about um, what's needed in terms of body, speech, and action to cultivate this really magnificent vision. So, <clears throat> I feel that um, when we're feeling sort of limited, or isolated, narrow, <clears throat> that we have teachings like the Shantideva and like in the Dhammapada that can give us some direction as to how to uh, expand our, um, our awareness and our intention yeah. so that it becomes uh, more focused, more aware, and also so much more compassionate. I think one of the things that um, we can understand from uh, Shantideva's perspective is the same way that when we uh, sit with each other and we're sitting alone, and I tried to suggest that you're never alone, but you're never not alone, that there's this unity of, of aloneness. So too, um, when Shantideva is, you know, expressing, may I become a source of joy and relief for all other beings. You're not literally at this moment doing that, but somewhere in your heart, you can understand that, that you are, that you are. In the same way that you know, when we're sitting alone, we can have the awareness that we're sitting together. That when I drink from my own cup of water or tea, at the same time, in my intention, I'm wishing that all those who are thirsty will have, you know, water and tea or whatever they need. So in my intention, even when I'm serving my own life, I can expand it so that it is also serving others. And that's just a matter of what type of awareness we bring into it. You know, that appreciative awareness. At the same time, you know, I can protect myself from feeling like, hmm, I'm always missing something. You know, that I'm very limited. And you can create a safe place for your island and that island can be a bridge. As you said, may I be a bridge for all of those who want to come over in a refuge. 
So yeah, you have to create a certain sanity in your, in your mind. And then that sanity will be an island for yourself. And then that island will be a refuge for others. So, would anybody like to unmute and share something of your experience of your, of your island, either with a question or comment that you might want to, um, you might want to share during our meeting now, since we're all together. So I have a question. Um, can you pass on this, um, as you call it, you know, this um, appreciation, this acceptance? How can you pass it on to someone who has no, who is in great need, but has no um, tools of um, accepting or not resisting? How, how can you do it for someone else? Can you? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. I mean, if you see someone very close to you who is suffering, and you see the suffering, and you'd like to ease the suffering, but you don't know how to do it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Especially since, you know, when Shantideva is saying, may I? it'll be the source of life and freedom for all others. So he's kind of like saying, I want to do that. So how can we do that? Yeah. Um, so the rest of, as I said, that the rest of the book, this was like the, the very beginning where he, he sets out this really incredible vision and wish that is so inspiring. You just want to, you know, agree with it. But then there's the work. And the rest of the book is going through all the sort of states of mind that you need to purify in order to uh, make that intention real. So what I'm saying is that um, the way we help others with their states of mind is by uh, changing our state of mind. That's, that's, you know, what we need to do. And then um, they will notice the peace in us. I mean, it's not, um, if someone comes and asks about the Dharma or asks for advice, you can be sort of, offer you know what you think you you can but um most of the time what we need to do is you know make peace in our own minds and our own body and our own speech and then that will have you know an effect outside of us um so basically the The short answer is we change by example. 
which is the hardest way. <laughs> and the longest way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It may take years to until they notice you. Yes, yeah, so, like if they if they're in real pain and suffering, it may take years until they open their eyes to to observe the change that you. Um. So you, and 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 when someone is really close to your heart and he's in real pain, it's not it's not that easy at all. And especially now when you have no one to escape, like you have nowhere to escape. You lock into your house and you and you see the suffering day after day. And you cannot go outside to have beer or just to free your mind, you're just facing this. Yeah. So being passive towards this, it's not it's not easy. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so I think um, here the, the teachings show us a little bit that, you know, we have to find new ways to be active. Like, mm -hmm. to be active through our, our wishes, our intentions, active with our own states of mind. Um, and, then, and then it starts to become like just the way we, we see the world. And, and it's true, other people may not notice, but um, that's not for us to um, control. You know, one of, the, uh, one of the hardest things to accept is that other people have their own um, negative karma. Mm -hmm. In that um, they have their lives to live and their minds to change. And, you know, there's accepting it and then wishing, you know, and um, wishing them compassion and loving kindness. So, um, generally, I do find, however, that though it may not be consciously um, recognized, when you do approach others with a mind of, of caring and non-judgment, um, they, they respond differently. Mm -hmm. you know, and um, just, just energetically, you're no longer like, oh, you know, yeah. But um but yeah, we're not looking for any type of magic uh you know result, especially if it's family members. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. If you want the people to notice a change in your life last, it's those you grew up with. <laughs> yeah. But um but the people around us, what we have to do is we have to notice the change, you know? We have to notice mm, there's, oh, fear rising, I'm gonna let go of the fear. There's anxiety rising, I'm gonna let go of the anxiety. And at the same time, I'm gonna wish that all others, as I wish myself to be free of fear and anxiety and anger. You know, my working on my fear or anxiety or anger or restlessness or you know doubt my working on that is strengthened by the wish that all others who are experiencing this will also be free of it when it's just for the sake of my own mind it's a um it's a weak effort so when we expand that intention to say like i'm troubled and you know and it's not just me it's it's everyone i wish this for myself and all others who are experiencing this that we'll be free of this i'll be free of it and anyone else who is experiencing this too 
suddenly then that intention has more power. That's the power of compassion. When it's not just for yourself, it's for all, all others who are experiencing something like you. It gives you a direct connection to them. And that's, that's one of the ways we can appreciate the appreciative awareness of the suffering we have in this moment, whatever the moment may be. It serves as a bridge to others who are experiencing something similar. So it actually has a, a way of connecting us. Even if you don't know who it is, you can be sure that there are others who are experiencing this right now. May I be free and may they be free too of this. So can I say that towards myself, the intentions are uh, active. I'm being active towards myself, but towards others, it's just passive intention. I guess. Can, can I mean, say that? I kind of think because we're connected in ways that we don't necessarily physically see, active and passive are, um, you know, it can be useful, but it might limit you. You know, maybe sometimes it's active, sometimes it's passive, maybe it's, you know, mm -hmm. I would just practice it and see what happens. Okay. Um, <laughs> so yeah. maybe active, passive, I don't know if that's useful. Because I want to, I want to shift my, myself. I want to, yeah, I want to to do good to myself so I can be active towards my own mind. I can mm -hmm. do some active uh, things and towards other, I cannot change them. So it's just passive wish. Mm. Yeah, oh. sort of, but because you're, if you change your own mind, you're going to change the way you relate and you act towards others, then it kind of goes together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Okay. Yeah, you can, if it's useful, you can think active passive, but you might also think that working on yourself at the same time is going to help you help others. So it's kind of connected. Mm -hmm. It's a continuum. I, I would want to see it more as a continuum. Mm. Like working on myself is, it's a side effect of, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just work and, you know, see what happens. Mm -hmm. Daniela, first of all, it's good to see you. And then uh, my question would be, there's attempts to become an island or rebuild islands and bridges. Where do we put all the failed attempts since we have so many? And how do we not stumble uh, in, those, in, the, in those pilages? And I'm using the metaphor since I couldn't figure any other way to ask the question. Can you ask the question again? <laughs> where do we where do we stumble when we're trying to? So we have all the failed attempts of trying to become this island or whatever the metaphors we've used. Yeah, and then um, and then we fail. Yeah, something happens, uh, and instead of and we and we react, something happens outside of us, and we think it's outside and oh, this happened to me, and why is this happening to me? And we're trying to mm. figure out yeah. what, what went wrong, what did I do wrong, how did this happen? I'm practicing, shouldn't this not happen? And mm. asking about um, a skillful means of approaching that. Um, mm. Because many times when I fail, it's as if all the failures suddenly you know you suddenly realize oh the ground is full of all those failures here mm. How, why am i even thinking that next time this is going to work mm. yeah 
Yeah. Well, when that comes up, you may notice, you may be able to recognize that it is a bit of the quality of, of skeptical doubt. You know, it's an, a negative state that's judging your failures as failures. You know, like when you, when you judge, when you're judging your um, practice in terms of success and failure, you know, then there's sort of the quality of skeptical doubt, which, you know, creates, it, it's a hindrance. It creates a big obstacle because it kind of says like, you know, there's this wall I can't get past. You know, that's why it's a, an obstacle. And it's an obstacle of sort of, oh, you know, misinterpretation. You're interpreting your, oh, pain that you experience as a failure, that like I did something wrong. Yeah. You're experiencing pain, right? You experience difficulty. You attempt to do good and you end up feeling pain or someone else experiences pain, right? You see that, then you interpret that as like, I failed my practice. Mm. So there must be something wrong with me or the way I'm practicing or maybe with the practice as a whole. There's something wrong there. Right. <clears throat> how can we how can we pay attention to that? You know? So the the question was sort of implying a type of um, a judgment, a serious judgment there. Like I succeed and I fail. You know, and it seems like that from a normal point of view. If I try to oh, live more harmoniously and have more equanimity, and then I find like something happens, I get upset. Well, my practice like was weak; it wasn't working. So, I think last week I mentioned the paramita, the great quality of patience. People don't like hearing that word. They just like have resistance to the idea that you're going to be making the same attempt over and over again and finding a lot of the same conditioned responses coming up until you become very familiar with them. So familiarizing yourself with those negative responses is a very important part of the practice. It's not that the negative responses should stop. That's like wishing magic. That it, okay, I'll be aware of it, and then like it'll, then I won't be having it anymore. So it worked. <laughs> Whereas, really, it's about being aware of it again and again and again, and applying your equanimity and acceptance to each time it arises. The island doesn't mean that you won't be experiencing difficult emotions. Those are long-term conditions, right? But those emotions won't flood your consciousness and make it seem like you're drowning. How? Because you recognize them again and again, and this is what's gonna happen. Why would I expect otherwise? So there's a sense of expectation that if I'm practicing well enough, eventually I'll just be okay. You know, like I won't have, I won't have negative emotions. <clears throat> I, I don't know if that's what the island is like. Maybe the island includes everything. So the patients here, is that you may be experiencing pain and difficulty for a long time. And can you appreciate that? <laughs> uh, is that good or bad news? 
<laughs> I know, I have to see. But I will try. Basically, what I'm trying to say, in short, is that when you experience, as we do so often, judgment, criticism, negative thoughts, anger, fear, hatred, the whole thing, whatever form it may take, okay, in terms of negative emotions and thoughts that are kind of self-centered or selfish in some way, and judgment and failure and, you know, self-criticism and all of that that then happens, you know, in response and then it kind of rolls out of control and, um, you know, it just makes me want to go have a drink. So, like, what, what do I do with that? If you're going to expect something, expect that that's going to happen. You know? You can expect it's going to happen. In the same way with that teaching of the glass with that Sha, you expect the glass is going to break. You know, what is the glass? The glass is your peaceful state of mind. That peaceful state of mind also is impermanent. It's going to break. So you know that it's going to break. You know, why did we expect, why are we always surprised by the, difficulty that arises in my mind. <clears throat> so, when I said, again, right to the beginning of this, this discussion, um, when we're talking about appreciating it, it doesn't mean I like it. It's like, okay, this is what I need, need to be aware of. This is my practice right now. Okay, this is my practice right now, right? It wasn't ending anger. It was being with the anger. It was uh, being fully aware of it so that it doesn't flood my life. If you don't notice it, it'll flood you. If you notice it, it'll pass. That is the difference between awareness that leads to equanimity and non-awareness that leads to, you know, just repeating the same patterns. Your awareness will keep you safe. Even if what you're aware of is pain. But don't take my word for it. Just, you know, try it out. Thank you. Anybody else before we sit for five minutes and then and say good night? Whatever you say is helpful. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the beautiful Dharma talk. So I don't know exactly what I want to say, but let's see. It's something about uh, asking about this situation. It's, it's pretty weird. It's like, uh, <clears throat> like I'm listening to you. I'm thinking about all the work, the spiritual work that needs to be done. And then there's this epidemic <laughs> also. <laughs> and it's, it's bothering me because it's like, it's flooding me. It's flooding my consciousness. So I'm like, th I'm listening to you and I'm thinking about the last question they asked you in my, you know, day-to-day -day routine life, uh, uh, you know, uh, trying to apply the Dharma in all the situation. And then this one got me, you know, it's like it comes and then it's like taking the carpet, you know, it's flooding the island. It's like, ah, but, you know, we're all going to die. I don't know, with the virus, you know, what's going to blah, blah, the end of the world. <laughs> so it, I don't know what to do. Is it in a... It's, I don't know what to do. It's like, okay, um, it's another thing to work with. It's a big thing. So I don't know how to approach it with, uh, with like a big thought that's disturbing the, my island. It's in kind of a weird way. Like, I don't know. I think you got the picture. Mm -hmm. 
how to work yeah. with the yeah. <laughs> yeah. pandemics. <laughs> mm. Well, first of all, you should recognize that you're not working with the epidemic. You're working with your fear. There's a difference. Okay. And that's what you need to, to work with and to be aware of. It's not the outer information. You know, that's news. And the interpretation you give the news is, you know, your, is your thing. But, um, but the, inner, the inner feelings that arise in response to the information you receive, that's where you place your awareness. You know, all those thoughts that come about, oh, you know, whatever predictions you may make, okay, those are being created by the energy of your fear. Now, saying that doesn't make the fear go away, but it gives you something to pay attention to. Rather than the content of those thoughts, the feeling of those thoughts, the energy of those thoughts, okay? The thoughts will keep changing form and coming up in different ways. But underneath that thought, there is a feeling, the feeling tone, they say, of those thoughts. So the feeling tone of that thought and the huge aversion you may have in, you know, to it, um, that's where you can you know, place your attention with a little more um, care. So that when the thoughts come up, instead of immediately going and say, okay, I need to be aware of the thoughts. No, go to something just slightly underneath those thoughts and it's the dis-ease, the dis-ease, the anxiety, okay, or the fear that you have underneath that and how it has symptoms in your body through your breath, through your stomach and through your muscles. Okay? So it's, you know, stay away from all the cognitive story because the story is like in meditation, you can go on with your thoughts and then you'll be lost for half an hour just following your thoughts. So, when we're talking about appreciative awareness, we're not appreciating the content of the thoughts and the story. That story is going to lead you astray. It's going to lead you down a road you don't want to go. Okay? It's a dead end. But when you can place your attention, your attention to the feeling tone that is feeding those thoughts, okay? you'll have something um, more alive to look at. It's your own life then that you're looking at. So that's where I would place your attention. When you notice that you're starting to, hmm, you know, get carried away by these thoughts, um, it's not the thoughts you should be necessarily looking at. Okay, Go to the physical symptoms of them the physical th symptoms which have a feeling tone and the feeling tone can often be um, recognized in your uh, breath and body. So that's, that's what I would spend a bit of time looking at when you come up, when you have these experiences. Yeah, that helps. Even now when I was listening to you, I said, I was like, ah, oh, I'm just, I'm afraid. Okay, ah, that's what I feel. Okay. Even, just, even just that for now was uh, relaxing in some way to be connected with this feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, like I'm terrified. And even to feel that for a minute and to really feel that, I was like, ah, okay, so that's what it is. So it, it even, in this minute it helped, but I think it's, uh, for the long time, I'll try to practice it, and I see the benefit of going there, leaving. Yeah. Uh, uh, hmm. yeah, and keep it located with your breath too, because the breath is where you will notice the changes in your feeling. Hmm. It becomes tighter, it becomes more shallow, it becomes deeper. You know, it's a good sort of measure of what's going on physiologically and mentally. So. 
Thank you. All right. So folks, let's spend a minute now just to end the evening, okay? I wanna invite you to sit for a minute with me and with each other. So we want to end with a dedication. May our practice be of benefit to ourselves and to all others. May we live our lives in such a way that it increases ease and decreases suffering and may our practice extend to help all others in whatever way May all beings be happy and peaceful. May they be free of illness and suffering. And may all beings realize true awakening. So thank you everyone for tonight. I was really happy to sit with you. And I hope you all have a good, healthy and happy week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. 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 הזדמנות נחמדה, אז טוב לראות אתכם. Uh, תודה רבה דניאל, תודה על השיעור ועל הזמן. Um, אנחנו נפגשים עכשיו כל בוקר וכל ערב בשבע וחצי, um, אז תמיד uh, מוזמנים. דוד, טוב, משמח לראות את כולם. תודה רבה. תודה, ביי ביי. להתראות, תודה דניאל. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Good night.